Thank the Lord indeed. Without him, there's not one of us who would have any reason to be here or any reason to hope. You know, the world doesn't understand that, but they don't know, do they? And I thank God for the Lord Jesus and for the hope that we have in him. Praise God. It's good to see so many this morning. I just wonder if there's anybody left in Florida. Uh, but praise God. It's good to see you and to have everyone, and from South Carolina as well. Praise God. Um, I just remind you to be in prayer concerning the upcoming trip. It's coming very soon. I'm trying to wrap my mind around it. It just seems like, you know, it's coming, and I praise God. I guess the Lord will have to help me when, get, when the time comes, but that's always the way, and he will. But Lord willing, a week from Wednesday, Tony and I fly out, so uh, uh, pray for us. We're going to try to hip-hop to all the places in one, one trip this time, and and uh, so just we'll take everybody's greetings, but I know we have many opportunities. It's going to be interesting. Uh, I, I know we're going to have a, a quick, quickie little one-day youth camp. I know there's going to be opportunities to be in poor areas and feed and, and, and encourage and teach. Uh, I know of one pastor's conference where we're going to be driving about 200 miles to get to it. We'll be almost on the southern tip of India. Well, the Philip has arranged something way down there, so that'll be an interesting ex excursion. Um, I'll be, I'm sure we'll see the lepers again and, and just uh, reach out and encourage them. I uh, understand Dottie's got, and RA's got an arrangement where we're going to be able to talk to an army unit there in the Philippines. That'll be a new uh, opportunity. So who knows? The Lord's got, Lord is the arranger of it, and we're just trusting in him. As long as we don't climb any cliffs this time, we'll be all right. <laughs> I think I've about outgrown that. <laughs> anyway, well, it didn't quite kill me last time, so whatever the Lord has, it'll be all right. Um, I just had a, th a thought come to me yesterday morning, and it, it kind of applies in a lot of areas, but uh, certainly my first thought was, boy, this is about me. This isn't for the people. This is something I need. But anyway, it seems like the Lord has developed it. So let's turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 3. It's a familiar passage to many of us. And Paul is describing his ministry and contrasting it with the law. But he comes down to verse 17 is where the thought came from. And then we'll just kind of ask the Lord to guide us and to, uh, to expand out from there. Because this absolutely applies to everyone here this morning. And as I say, it applies first to me. But uh, I just ask the question, is everybody here free this morning? I mean, just completely free. There's just no areas of need or bondage in your life. You're just out. You're there. I mean, no. I, that, see, that's true of every one of us. We have needs, don't we? Now, Paul is saying this. He's writing this. Now the Lord is the Spirit. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And that was the thought. That was the heart of it. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's freedom. Now, you know, I've said on a number of occasions recently, and the Lord has made it more and more real to me, that we as a people were created in the beginning to be animated, to be empowered by God's life. There's no other way we are meant to, to function. We were, we were endowed with glorious and wonderful gifts from him to, uh, to create, to enjoy pleasure, just a, a thousand and one things that, that are a part of our makeup naturally because we are children, because we are the offspring of God, as Paul said, we are created in his image. But none of those things have any real meaning unless God's Spirit is at the center and the heart of it, unless they are literally energized as an expression of His being. You remove that and you remove the very reason for our existence. You remove every barrier to, uh, to corruption, to, to what we call sin, because sin is basically simply missing God's purpose. It's, it's moving outside of the purpose for which we were created. It's not a list of don't do this and don't do that. I mean, it comes down to some of those things. But the fundamental thing is that is man trying to live apart from God, there's nothing he can do but sin. 
And this, this passage talks about, this text talks about freedom. But what happens when men try to live apart from God being at the center and being the very life that is being expressed? What happens? Don't, don't look at me that way. <laughs> okay, I'll have to tell you. It's just simply slavery, bondage. Instead of man being free to be who God created him to be, he becomes a slave. And one becomes a slave to his intellect and his pride. Another becomes a slave to this capacity we have for pleasure, except that it pulls him in every wrong direction with self at the center, and he becomes absolutely overpowered and a slave to sin. And this is a condition from which there is no human answer. There is no way for us to escape what we have come to refer to in many instances as sin's prison. It's a prison. There is no, there's absolutely no way out of it. Jesus talked to some of the religious leaders, and at one point they claimed to believe in him, some of them. And he said, continue in my word, and you, if you're my disciples indeed, you'll continue in my word, and, and anyway, it'll lead to freedom. What was their answer? What was their response to that? So we've never been, you know, we're not, we're not anybody's slaves. We've never been in bondage to any man. What do you mean we'll be set free? And Jesus, what did Jesus say there? Whoever sins, that is whoever practices sin, is a servant of sin. Paul said plainly in Romans chapter 6, he's describing the, 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 our need to yield ourselves to the, to the life of God, to the grace of God, says to, who, to, to whomever you yield yourselves, you become the servant to whatever you yield to. But the thing is, apart from the Spirit of God, men have no defense. They have no way to avoid becoming ensnared by, by the very desires that God created to be a blessing. They turn into a curse. And they lead to corruption, they lead to death, and there is no escape. And so Paul is, first of all, he's dealing with that need. It's the need of the gospel of Jesus Christ to reach out and actually do something about this. And his contrast, as I say, in the passage is about the ministry of the law versus the ministry of the Spirit. And uh, you go back into the previous passage... And he's talking about, let's look at verse 14 of chapter 2. He says, but thanks be to God who always leads us in triumphal procession. Boy, that sounds pretty good. Wouldn't that be a good thing in our lives to be in such a relationship to him? Regardless of what our life is about, the details of it, to actually have him in charge and leading us? Because I'll tell you, when he leads, it is a triumphal procession. Uh, triumphal procession. It leads somewhere. There is a reason, there is a purpose. It's going somewhere. Thank God. And it says, and through us spreads everywhere the fragrance of the knowledge of him, for we are to God the aroma of Christ. Paul's message was not simply words. It was not religious doctrine. It was not anything. It was absolutely the living Christ. Everywhere he went, everywhere he expressed himself in the, the message that God had given to him, the people did not simply contact a bunch of ideas. They contacted the very Spirit of God. And so Paul goes on into... Chapter 3, and as I say, he contrasts his ministry with that of the, of the law, of the letter. Now the law of God was basically a whole lot of things that they were not to do, and if they did them, they would be, they would be judged for them. Is that right? Thou shalt not have any gods before me. Thou shalt not do... You know, it was a whole lot of commandments. And what was the purpose of those commandments? What, why did God do something like that? To show us that we need, that we have needs. In other words, he did not show us the law to give us a way by which we could qualify ourselves to be accepted by him. There is no such thing. The need is too great. 
And the problem with the Pharisees in Jesus' day was that they had found a way in their own deluded thinking. They had found a way to take the words of Moses and twist them into a religious lifestyle. And in their minds, as long as they observed that lifestyle, they were good to go. They were acceptable to God, and he liked them, and they looked down on everybody else who didn't live according to their rules, and that was their, that was their life. And it was those very people that Jesus said, if you sin, you commit sin, you are the servant of sin. You need to be set free. But all oh, what can, the problem with the law is so simple. It tells me what to do, but it doesn't give me any power to do it. Oh God, it doesn't touch the need of my heart. Without him, I am, I am lost, I am hopeless. There's nothing in here that has any power to do what is right. I'm constantly fighting something in here, but look what, listen to the words of Paul who cried out, oh wretched man that I am. Who shall deliver me from this body of death? Oh, thank God. God had to bring it. Has God ever brought you to that place? Where you understand? You know, it must sound crazy for us to come together and sing about the blood of Jesus. What in the world is that all about? What's the penalty of sin? What did Jesus say? What did the, God say at the beginning? It's death. You know, we were practicing a song this morning. I should have been crucified. That's the truth. And the song Barabbas. I don't know whether the real Barabbas got this or not. But the truth is, this, is there. He went to the cross in my place. I'm the one that should have died. But if I paid the penalty of my sin, that would be the end of me. But oh, the love of God that opened up a way for someone who was without sin to go to that cross and to take, to take my guilt. Oh my, the law demands the death of every sinner. Do you think God in all of his justice can ignore that and just say, well, I just feel so sorry for them. I'm going to let them in anyway. No. God, the miracle is that God has found a way to uphold his justice and yet to allow for mercy. Jesus took upon himself every bit of my guilt. He paid the price in full. He didn't leave anything for me to pay. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. The blood that poured from his wounds on that cross represent the death that he died for me. And I tell you, when Jesus saw the blood of that sacrifice, I mean, the Father saw the blood of that sacrifice, he accepted it. The justice of God was completely satisfied. I tell you, everyone who comes to him and, and recognizes their need and opens their heart and say, Oh God, there's nothing I can bring, nothing I can do. I have to humble myself and become the sinner that I am. And just completely put my trust in you. You're the only one who can save me and help me. That opens the door for God to show you mercy. But his help is not just information on how to live a successful lifestyle. I don't need that. I need Jesus. I need actual life. And so Paul's message in contrast to the law just telling me what to do and not giving me any power to do it, Paul's message was Jesus. At every point it's not a religion, it's not a doctrine, it's a person. And that person sits on a throne in heaven but he fills heaven and earth by the Spirit. That's that one who sits on the throne that we worship rightly today. He's here today. Our eyes are limited to the spirit, to the physical realm, but he is here and he resides in people's hearts that have opened their heart to him. There is a new life that we can have in him. Once, a, once the sin question has been moved from the, from the picture, once God has cleansed from sin, 
then there's a vessel that he can come in and he can live and he can impart a brand new life. That's the message of the gospel. Do you know any other way that deals with the, with the bondage and the, of sin with a, with a, that can possibly give me freedom? You got another way that I can be free? Oh, my. You know, we have all kinds of people here this morning. This applies in one way or another to everybody. But if you're, I just pray that God can open hearts who are in need because his heart reaches out not in condemnation, but in love. What do you think it was that allowed Jesus to go into place of sinners like us? He reached out of the very heart of the love of God. It shows the kind of a God that he is. He longs to reach out and to cleanse and to set free. You think he's happy to see people that are in bondage and captivity to sin? Oh, we cling to the very thing that is carrying us over the cliff to destruction by nature. And yet we have no power to let go of ourselves. And yet our pride keeps us right there. I can do it. I can. It's my life. I can do as I please. Oh, God, deliver. God, just convict where it's needed. Set people free from, the, from that awful captivity of sin. There's freedom. We'll never be free unless the Lord comes on the inside. That's the whole thing. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, liberty, freedom. I need that freedom. I have no power to be free from anything that this world offers except through him. Oh, I, I, all I can do is, is put this out and say, God, just take it. Convict of sin, but do it with the, with the love that you've shown me. Reach out and embrace somebody and just bring them to that place that where there is freedom. There's no freedom apart from him. I'll go back to this. We were not made to live independent lives. There is no possibility of our ever being what God made us. There's no possibility of our being anything but a slave. We live in a world populated by devils who hate God and hate you. They, are, they have had thousands of years of practice of knowing how to, how to appeal to this nature of ours and sell us a lie that if you will go this way, if you will do that, you will discover what you need. You will be fulfilling your destiny. You'll be satisfying the, the needs that you have in your life. Keep scratching that itch. Yes, I know you're miserable now, but if you'll scratch it a little more, you'll get there someday. Oh, God, what a lie. We, this devil has been is blind to the world. You know, Paul prefaces what he says in verse 17, but whenever anyone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. There is something blocking people's vision. And you go on into chapters 4 and you see what it is. Verse 3, and even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. Now, why is that? The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers. Why? So that they cannot see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For we preach not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord and ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who said, let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Boy, do you see how much we need him? This goes all the way back to the beginning. God in the beginning said, let there be light, and there was light. You know, there's a, that God is here today. Do you know he has the power to look into somebody's heart and command, let there be light? Yes. Folks, we have the privilege, if, if we know him, of praying and saying, God, Open hearts. God, let, that, let the veil just be pulled back. Let it be torn down. Let all illusion disappear. Let people who are in need see their need and understand that there's no answer. Religion will not do it. You know why people gravitate to religion? Why do they gravitate to religion? I'm using religion in a, spe a specific way here. 
It's because it, religion simply gives man stuff to do and stuff to believe. But it leaves him as the master of his own soul. I'm in charge, and if I only will take this lifestyle, this belief system, this way of living to myself, and I will practice this, then I will meet my need. Oh, no, you will not. That religion will descend with you into hell. There's only one answer, and that's Jesus. We need his life. We need to come to a place where we have, our vessel once again becomes inhabited by the very life of God. Then freedom begins to happen. And the first thing he does is set me free from my sins. How many of you know the difference between feeling your need of, of God and, the, and the, the horrible guilt of the sense of how your sins have separated you from a holy God and then to come to a place where you, get, you lay it at the feet of the cross and suddenly the guilt is gone. We serve a risen Savior who has the power to erase even the guilt that we live under to take it away and to cause us to know that we've been accepted by him. That the Father has accepted the sacrifice that he made at that cross. Oh, praise God, we do have everything to shout about today, to be thankful for. There is freedom in Christ. Oh, if you're laboring under the bondage of sin, you can't break free, you're stuck, and there's nothing you can, everything you've tried has not worked. There's only one. You're going to have to lay down your pride. You're going to have to come as a broken sinner and lay, down, lay at the feet of the cross and say, Oh God, take over. I cannot do this. I cannot live. I cannot be what I ought to be. Oh my, that's true for every single one of us here. We cannot live. We, have, we don't have the power to do it. Oh, my sufficiency. It's the same thing Paul said about his ministry. So I'm not competent to do this. See, even in ministry, Paul was confessing his utter inability. Say, God gave me this ministry, but my competence, my ability to do it, does not come from anything that resides in me. I can't do this. But God has made me able. Why did God make Paul able? So he could lift up Paul and we could say, wow, Paul, yay, Paul. No. He came down upon an unworthy sinner who declared himself to be the chief of sinners, poured out his power and his spirit upon him, and sent him forth into a world that hated God with a message of life and hope. And one after another, people gravitated to that message and people were set free and congregations were formed and city after city after city. They'd start a congregation and then they'd stone him and run him out of town or something. But God was reaching into a world. It was the heart and the love of God reaching right into the Satan's strongholds and declaring, I understand where you're at. I know that you're in a place you cannot escape. But I want you to know there's freedom in Christ. I want you to know that I have the power to set you free. If you'll call upon the name of Jesus, you can be set free. See the love of God just engineering all of this? And this is what Paul was declaring to these people. I've got, a, I've got a message, and my message is not a doctrine. It's a person. The Lord is the Spirit. He talked about the ministry of the letter, which is just words, ideas, and the ministry of the Spirit. Literally, he meant that when he preached, and God was there inspiring what he preached, his words were more than words. There was a spirit, the very spirit of God that went forth and that spirit had the power to enter into someone's life and break strongholds. So the weapons of our warfare over in chapter 10, they're not carnal, they're mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. He was talking about his ministry. Now I know that applies on an individual level where we have the power to, to, stand, to withstand the thoughts of the enemy and to cast them down and to find freedom. But Paul was talking about his ministry there. I've got something. I don't have to stand here and try to tell people what to do knowing that they can't do it. Oh God, there's so much that is called Christian. It's labeled Christian. And all it is is a bunch of ideas that come from the Bible that are imposed upon people without the Spirit. And what's the result? Bondage. 
Oh, all you do is put people in greater jail than they were to begin with. My God, I just pray that God will set me free in a greater way. As I say, my first thought when I read this, I said, man, I need this. I'm just conscious, especially facing this trip. My God, I'm just conscious how much I need him and how many things there are that are lacking in my life, how many areas of bondage there are. I need greater freedom. Where is free? Where is the place of freedom? It's where he is. I can't go to a seminar and get a list of you know, nice little, nice little formula where I can, do, well, okay, now I'll do this, and I'll do this, and then I'll be free. No, freedom is Christ. Yes. Period. End of story. If, if my faculties are not, are not absolutely given life, if life is not breathed in by the Spirit of God to what I do, it's worthless. God help us. God help me here. I... I I want, to, I want to give out something that has life in it. And I'm just so conscious as I walk up here. And I had to say it again this morning. I said, God, I can't do this. But you can. <laughs> but that applies to every one of our lives. God, I can't do this. And then he turns around and says, but I can. And that's how it's supposed to be. Oh, we are so full of pride and self-sufficiency. Man, we just want to get a hold of it and do it and feel like, I, look what I did. Oh, God, aren't you, aren't you happy with me? It's our nature. We don't say that outwardly. But that's how we think. Oh, my God, what a blessed place of freedom the Lord has for us when we stop trying and start trusting in Him. You know, that's, a, that's such a central principle is that coming to God is not a matter of doing and trying. How many of you know what I'm talking about? You tried? Any of you succeed at that? Not a one. Unanimous. But to him that works not, that doesn't work, but believes on him who justifies, declares righteous the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. There's not a thing I can offer to God and say, here's the righteousness that I need in order to be accepted from you. You think God's going to walk up and say, yeah, that'll do. Put it to my account. No. There's no such thing. I can't offer him that. But I can believe in his son and what he did for me. And that faith, that confidence, that trust, that's a conscious, it's not just a mental thing. This is my heart putting my full weight of trust on what he did for me instead of what, anything I could do. I've got to stop doing, realize that I can't do it, abandon the effort, and say, Lord, I have only one thing I can offer. I can put my trust in your son. He says, yes, that's what I'm looking for puts my name down in his book. There's a righteous man. He believes in my son. It's his power to save me that, has, that gives me any hope at all. That levels the field, folks. There's not one of us, as I've said so many times, that can look down on another saying, I'm better than you. I'm not. Are you? We, everyone, have the same need. We may not have had the same background, the same earthly circumstances, but one sinner is as bad as another. We have the same need. But oh, what a glorious message, Paul. The Lord is that spirit. Where the spirit of the Lord is, there's freedom. I'll tell you, the only thing that'll make you and me free is when he literally comes in to live. Yes. Then freedom starts. Praise God. But as I say, when I first was thinking about this, I was thinking in terms of me and realizing just how many things in my life are needy. How many areas where if I'm going to be honest, I'm not free. The Lord has purchased a freedom. I mean, we can, we can sing, I'm free, I'm free to be the servant of the Lord, and it's true, and it's good to confess the truth. But, I, but every one of us here has areas of our lives and we need 
more freedom than we have. There's areas where I run on my own strength, I get careless. So many ways we can be imprisoned through fear. It's a common one. It's getting quiet. Oh my, how, what a terrible lie that is. God hasn't given us the spirit of fear. But he's given us the, power, the spirit of power and of love and of self-control, I guess it is in the NIV. Sound mind. But how many people are in prisons because they're afraid? They've grown up, they've learned how to think and learn, and devil has just ministered to them a, a spirit of worry, anxiety, fear. I just, I don't know what's going to happen. I, don't, I can't do this. I'm afraid of that, this danger or that danger. Or what if God doesn't like me today? Or thousand and one things that are irrational when you hold them up to the light of God's word. But they're real. Oh my. We need the Lord, don't we? We need to come to a greater place of freedom in Him. I'm trying to think of which way to go. Let me. Th I, I heard a testimony recently that would probably fit in pretty well right here. And it was somebody who was really, really thoroughly caught in a lifestyle that was sinful. And he became aware that it was sinful and his, what he did, his approach was to, oh God, I know this is wrong. Please take this desire away from me. Oh God, please take this desire away from me. And he didn't. And years later, he came to understand something that I think is important for every one of us. How many of you have ever prayed that way about something? Yeah. Take it away. Do you know what that's like? I've got something bad in me. Oh, God, suck it out. If God sucked out everything that was bad out of us, <laughs> God isn't interested in creating a vacuum. But that's the, real, that's the logic behind that. Oh, God, if you don't want me to do this, take the desire away. It doesn't work that way. And you know what the answer eventually was? It was when Christ really came in and possessed him. And that new life began to flow. The other one just kind of went away. And he found that the new life gave him power where the other wasn't important anymore. We don't need to get rid of stuff. We need Jesus to flow into the areas of our lives that are in need. Oh, God, I, I want to stop doing this. I want to stop thinking this way. I want to, oh, God, suck it out, Lord. Get your vacuum cleaner. Get rid of this thing. Instead of looking to him, lifting our eyes. You know, when, what does it say here? When, when everyone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. The ability to see, the ability to, to understand. And we begin to see that the answer is the Lord. I need him in those areas where I stand in need. Anybody identify with this? I think I've mentioned this before, but we have people write to us. And it's evident from their letters, or emails in my case, that they've got, de they've got devils. They're literally in their life tormenting them, and they're aware that that's what it is. And they want help, and it's understandable. But I'll tell you what, there's no help for just getting a devil out. If that's all you want to do is get a devil out so you can go on and live your life, forget it. What happens when a devil goes out of a man? He walks through dry places. And, gee, this is the words of Jesus. Seeks rest and can't find it. 
So he says, I'll go back to the house from whence I came out. You know the devils think of people as their house, the place they live? They formed themselves a home there. They got, their, got your mind all arranged according to suit them. They use your lusts and your to satisfy theirs. It's a nice arrangement for them. Wicked things. But the devil says, I'm going to go back to my house from where I came out. But what happens when he, came, when he went back? He found it empty. Swept and garnished. Cleaned up. Stop doing all that bad stuff. I'm clean. I'm free. The devil's gone. But it's empty. And what happens? He takes seven more devils. Worse than he is. And they enter in. And his condition is worse in the end than it was in the beginning. And somehow you try to, you try to talk to people. About their need and. The need is to get Christ in. They're so zoned in on the problem instead of looking to Jesus and saying, Oh God, I, I need you to come and fill me. Come and give me new life. Cleanse me from everything. Fill, me, fill my life, Lord. They're going to find those devils will skedaddle. They won't have any place there anymore. Why? Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's freedom. That's why they don't have freedom, because the Lord's not there. Sometimes people are, they're churchgoers. They did this, they did that, and somehow devils just got a deep hold, and I don't get it. You know, some of you remember this, and I don't certain, certainly don't want to make fun in the slightest, but some of you remember a lady came to us several years ago. Oh my, she just held court there for a long time, telling us all about how she'd been filled with the Spirit and all of her religious pedigree and all about it. And then this wonder of wonders, these devils just lived in her and had all kinds of physical manifestations that were great distress to her, and she couldn't understand it. She would try and stomp her foot, and they wouldn't go and what, you know, I mean, she was almost like up here spiritually telling us down here what she needed. Is that, is that about right? And the problem was, the very spirit that she thought was the Holy Ghost was a demon. And she got something from that old religion. She went to one of these sign and wonder preachers years ago, and man, she got something all right. But that devil was, became the gatekeeper, just letting his buddies in and, and putting her round and having her spin round and round and round. She went stomping her foot and trying to call on the, what she thought was the Holy Ghost to help her. And what a crock. What a, what a deception. You suppose that it's really possible to be full of the Holy Ghost and have devils too? Does that make any sense? Are devils going to hang around if you're really and truly full of God? The answer is not to get devils out, it's to get Jesus in. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's freedom. If He is in the heart, there will be, to that degree, there will be freedom. God help me, first of all, but God help you as well. You know, one thing encourages me in this, because the devil could certainly turn this around and say, what's the matter with you, all these needs? Verse 18, and we who with unveiled faces all reflect the glory of God, the Lord's glory, or we contemplate is another way to look at it. We're looking. We're, that's what our eyes are focused upon. Right now, God has taken the veil away so we can see the real deal. Yes. But in that light, we are not looking at the problem. We are looking at the solution. We are looking at the person who is the solution. It's His glory. What's happening when, when that is happening? We're seeing the real deal. We're looking at him. We are being transformed into his likeness. With ever increasing glory, where does that come from? Which comes from the Lord who is the Spirit? Well, that sounds to me like it's a matter of process, doesn't it to you? 
If, I, if there is something, a situation where I need increasing glory, then I don't have all of, I don't have that now. I need something that I don't have. So that reminds us that, you know, though we have needs, we can be encouraged and know that God is reaching out not to say, what's the matter with you? Why aren't you further down the road? But rather to say, I love you. I see the hurt. I see the wounds, I see the struggles, I see the fears, I see the habits, I see the way the devil has played with your mind and formed thoughts and habits in your, I see all of that, I love you. Your need is not better principles, your need is for Jesus to come in and displace that. If you want to get something out of a container, you've got something that isn't good in there, What's the best way to do it? Again, do you suck it out? No. You displace it with something else. That's my need. I know none of us here has the perfect thought patterns of our lives, do you? We just, all the time, we're full of faith and rest and peace and everything is just glorious. We're just... Floating through life, trust, perfect trust in God. Everything is right. We're never afraid, never resentful, never angry, never. No. Do you think maybe there's just some needs in our lives where God needs to flow in? It's like we got these dry places in us. Oh, God, get rid of the dryness. Oh, God, please take the dryness. Okay, let some water in. Think about it. It's the same principle as trying to get, trying to get something out and without putting something in. The vacuum principle. But here we are in these areas of bondage and need. I need Jesus. And you know, Jesus said, I am the way, but he said, I am the truth. And I am the life. All those things are intertwined. We're not going to have him just like some magic something. It's just going to fix everything. You know, Jesus said those who worship him must worship him, true worshipers, must worship him in what? Spirit and truth. Now you get those two things out of balance, you've got a problem. You've got some people who have gone way over into the ditch on the truth side and their whole ministry is all about getting people to line up with their doctrines and get the doctrines right and everything will be great and grand. Dot every I or cross every T, whichever way it goes. Oh, we got to get the truth right. Oh, don't depart from that. We got the truth. We got all we need. No, you don't. You need the spirit. Dead truth won't help anybody. Dead truth has the same effect as law. It tells you all about what you ought to be and should do. It doesn't give you a bit of power to do it. But oh, you got some people that run off in the other ditch. Oh, it's the Spirit, it's the Spirit. We got to get full of, full of the Spirit and happy and, full and joyful and shouting and, and, and praise God. And next thing you know, the devil has taken some, some way off into the wilderness, ministering experiences and feelings, just like that lady came to us. Man, she was, what was her reason for having confidence? I had this glorious experience. Unfortunately, it was not balanced with truth, and it was a devil. But oh, how we need both. But when Jesus comes to us about areas of need in our lives, he's going to be telling us some truth. And sometimes it's not something we want to hear. Has your pride ever risen up? And you hear something from the Lord and you know it's true, but I don't want to accept that. And you fuss and fight and say, no, it isn't that way, it's this way. And I, you know, we just sort of try to wiggle around it. I'll tell you, I need the light of God's truth. And peace and freedom will never come except we walk in the light. As he is in the light, there's no darkness in him. The darkness is in us. 
And we have a Savior who is able to minister what Paul is talking about. Where the, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's freedom. If there's an area of your life and mine that's not free, do you suppose maybe, just maybe, we need the Lord to flow into that area? There's a song we've sung a few times in the past. My heart is like a house. <laughs> and it talks about the secret room. I've got this secret room. I don't even go in there. It's full of stuff. I don't even want to think about it. It's just... But when did freedom come? Hand the Lord the key. Yes, amen. He opens the door. You walk in there and you look at all the ugly. And he says, I died, I died for that. I have the power to clean this mess up and set you free. And the fear, the fear of that room is gone. You've got areas of your life you're afraid to even face. The Lord wants to take you by the hand and set you free and go into that place and let it be filled with his life. And peace and freedom follows. The devil will do everything in his power to fill our minds with his lies. So that we stay in that place of bondage where we're at. We need the spirit of truth to come and open our hearts and minds. And just break down the resistance of our wills. Not because God is a bully, but because he longs to set his children free. How, do you think it makes him happy to see us in bondage? Does that fill, his, fill him with joy, satisfaction? No. The longing of his heart is, is to flow into every nook and cranny of our life. And just fill it with his life. Why? Because he knows that's where, the, that's where joy and freedom comes. That's what eternity is going to be like. You think you're going to take those secret rooms and take them off to heaven with you? We need the Lord to fill every bit of our lives and our minds with his truth to wash us and cleanse us and these things don't come all at once I mean you, you there's I don't even know how to explain it but I'll tell you there's a point where where he comes in where there's a real new birth there's a real cleansing from the from sin from the guilt of sin where he literally gives us the gift of, of eternal life but then the work starts of really changing us, conforming us to the image of His Son. And there is going to be a, a walk through this life. There's going to be a confronting of difficulties. There's going to be situations where we're going to have to stand in faith and know how to thank God, know how to trust Him, where He's going to be confronting the areas of the specific areas of need in our lives and bringing us to a place where we are willing to let go and just let Him in. Because when he comes in, there's freedom. You know, I, I came to the church about 44 some years ago, and it was right on the heels of the remarkable visitation in the late 60s. I remember hearing one of the first tapes, I guess, I heard when I came and I first started visiting the church was a, me a message that Brother Thomas preached, I guess, in 1968. So that's 45 years ago. And it was up the mount with God. Some of you remember that? There's some of you that have heard it and some were here. Ruth, I know you were here. And the best I can recall after all these years is that there was, God gave a vision in the service and it showed a mountain. And the higher you went on the mountain, the brighter it got. And way down in the valley, it was murky and dark and you get the picture. And the message was about living in the spirit realm and not just in the, this low carnal state. Because that's where devils operate. That's where we're within the reach of devils. But the higher we get, the more we move away from that, the more we reach out for God, the more we let him rule our lives. And we're, we live in his presence and we live in his, with a consciousness of him and a desire for him and his presence in our lives the higher we get in a place of light and freedom and devils can't get up there. It's a pretty interesting picture, isn't it? Yeah. And a lot of our trouble is living carelessly, living in a 
kind of a carnal state, just putting one foot in front of another, sleepwalking. Anybody here do that ever? We sleepwalk through life. We're not really praying in the spirit. I mean, how do you, how does this presence of God really become real to us and become effective in our lives? That's what we're talking about. It's not that he's not there. But many times we are not enjoying his presence. We are not enjoying the fruit of what Jesus died to give us. For example, David said, enter into his gates with thanksgiving, into his courts with praise. That's a wonderful attitude to cultivate. But it's a habit, isn't it? It's something that, that really goes against what we are by nature. And it's not that we have to work to earn God's presence, but there are, there are steps of obedience that, that, are, that work together with him. We reach out to him. It's an exercise of faith to say, thank you, Lord. I praise you, Lord. I know things don't look particularly great right now, but thank you, Lord, because I know that I'm in your hands. I know you love me. I know you're concerned. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep a positive heart and spirit. I'll tell you, if most of our trouble is that the devil will get us focused on something. Weakness, need, whether it's internal, external, God is going, the devil, rather, is going to get us focused on something, and he's going to put a record on and make it stick. Round and round and round, the, record, the same record plays. You'll never be anything. Nothing will ever change. This situation is hopeless. Whatever, whatever the particulars are, he will absolutely play that record until we take it off and break it and throw it away. How many of you know what a record is? <laughs> I just, <laughs> just realized the technological advances here. But <laughs> used to be a record would, one of these plat platter things would, would get a scratch in it. And then instead of the needle continuing, it would jump back and you keep jumping back. That's what, for all of you young folks, that's what that's about. <laughs> but anyway, the devil is real good. Well, you know, some of these digital players, you can play, you can have repeat, you can set repeat up. That's what he does in, in, modern, in modern technology. But whatever it is, the devil has a way of trying to wear a track in our brain. And we fall into that and it becomes a rut and a rut becomes a prison, becomes a grave if we're not careful. And God needs to shine the light of truth. We need to let him shine the light of truth there. And when he reaches out, we need to reach back. That's faith. That's not working for anything. Jesus did all the work. But that's believing in what he did and the fact that it applies to me. His truth will set me free if I will believe it instead of his lies. That's letting the Spirit of God come into that part of my mind and my thinking. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's freedom. There's areas in every single life, every single mind here, where the Lord wants to set us free. And the simple things of life, praising God, reaching up to Him, thinking about Him, turning our minds, getting control of our thinking to where we're, we're saying, devil, I don't have to think that way anymore. You're telling me a lie. God's Word says this. I stand upon it. What do, you, what do you think that does? You think God says, well, good for you. No, there is, he rushes to that. There is truth. There's, his spirit literally flows to that situation. You have a different source of life that comes into play and sets free. His life is the only thing that has the power to do that. What about where Jude said to pray? Building up, pray in the Holy Ghost, building yourselves up in the faith. We think prayer is just sort of a duty where I'm supposed to read a laundry list to God or a Christmas list. No, it's meant to be a point of contact between us and God. Where there is a literal sharing of life. Boy, it'd be nice if our eyes could be open. We could see what was going on sometimes. We would see light flowing. We would see something that is real. I'll tell you, if you know him and you've been in these places, you know it's real. You know this is not just something, this is not just positive thinking. This God is real. 
Salvation is real. And where His Spirit is, there is freedom. If there is something in your life that's not free, or mine, and mine, then maybe the Lord's not there like He needs to be. Maybe, he, maybe we need to open up and let Him flow to that dry, dusty, bound place and let Him have it. Because when He gets there, He has the power to set free, to set captives free. And I believe with all my heart, God longs to give a greater freedom to His people. There's no lack on His part. Is there anything that He has not done? Anything He's left undone to, to make this happen? No, Jesus paid it all. Before He expired on the cross, He said, it's finished, it's accomplished. Oh, I don't know. I, I, I just can't imagine the devil had a clue what that was about, but he found out pretty quick, didn't he? Tried to keep him in the grave, and three days later, well, that didn't work. <laughs> he came out, and the, and the rest is history. Oh, what a glorious gospel we have. It's not doctrine, it's Jesus. If you've got Jesus in your life, and in every part of your life, to that extent, there is freedom. If you don't know Him today, if you've never opened up your heart and really trusted Him to save you from your sins, you can do that in a moment of time. The Lord helping you. And He will come in and He will take the guilt and He will take the bondage out of your life. And when, you, and when He fills it, those bondages, those prisons that have held you captive, they're going to go. Not because you're strong, not because of your willpower, but because of His power. Do you think that the bondage of sin and the Spirit of God can coexist? No, we just need more of Him. And He's available to every single person today. So let's just believe Him and trust Him and reach out to Him with all of our hearts as we walk day to day. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Praise God.